Okay. Hello again, folks. Just a reminder, keep your mics muted if you could. Um, and if you can keep your video on so that I can actually see you and we can actually have hands up and that kind of thing. Uh, so I'll call to order the City Council meeting for Monday, June 22nd, 2020. Um, I have a, uh, uh, Madam Clerk, on the minutes. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. There can be a motion to adopt the minutes of the regular council meeting held on June 8th and adopt the minutes of the special council meeting held on June 15th. Someone want to move it? It'll get moved and seconded. Any errors or omissions? Uh, yeah, yes, I got one. Okay. Councilor Wolf? Yes, thank you. Um, the, there's one incorrect um, minute. Um, so it, on, for item number 14, it shows that I was opposed uh, in general purpose committee, but in fact, it was Councilor Au and Councilor Steves. Um, the, if you watch the minutes video at, at one hour, 42 minutes and 47 seconds, uh, I put my hand up in support, but Harold and, and Jack. What page are we on, opposed. Michael? All right, so the, mo the minutes should read and the agenda should read uh, that for the road changes in Stevenson Village, who was opposed to that? Harold? Uh, when, uh, yeah, Harold and Chuck. Harold and Chuck. Um, Harold, you haven't disagreed with that, so uh, I take it that that's accurate. So with that change, then I'll call the question of Madam Clerk, if you could note that change. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, any opposed? That is carried. Um, we don't have any delegations registered. We don't have any delegations here, so we don't need to go into Committee of the Whole. The consent agenda highlights are the receipt. What's this? Oh, yes. Yes. Sorry. Before I get to the consent agenda, uh, there's the agenda addition. Uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. There is an agenda addition, and it will be item 14A, and it is a uh, proposed motion from Councillor Green regarding Stateston Village accessible stalls. But uh, can you read it out? Read oh, I'm sorry. The and the proposed motion is direct staff to review accessible street and city-owned parking spaces in Stateston and provide recommendations for improvement. All right. We have a motion on that, the agenda with that uh, addition. Someone put their hand up. Okay, moved and seconded. Any discussion on that? All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay, so that's carried. So that brings us to the consent agenda. We've got a receipt of committee minutes, a new coastal strategy, the Richmond Cultural Harmony Plan implementation of strategic directions, the application to request a food primary entertainment endorsement for the food primary liquor license at the Western Wall Center, Vancouver Airport, the proposed amendments to the traffic bylaw, the engine brakes and cyclist crosswalk regulations. And for the Phoenix Net Law, uh, first of all, we have the public consultation process. And secondly, we have the deconstruction and salvage. We have a motion to adopt those by general consent. Okay, so that's moved and seconded. Okay, so I have, let's see, on the speaker's list, um, I've got Councillor Day. And Councilor Wolf, that's all I have. And Councilor Alf, that's all I have for now. Councilor Day. Thank you very much, Mayor Brody. Um, yeah, I will be uh, supporting everything on the consent agenda. Uh, I wanted to speak to a few things. Um, number seven is the new coastal strategy. Uh, I want to thank uh, Councilor Seas for bringing this forward. I think it's an extremely exciting plan. And what it does, of course, is it it deals with the, um, the effect of the accumulative result of all of the developments that have happened along the Fraser River and, of course, the whole estuary. And, you know, when I was working against the jet fuel project, along with that were all of the other projects that were coming in at the same time. And uh, the, the province and the feds just didn't look at the accumulative effects. So I think this new coastal strategy is an extremely good idea and its time has come. Uh, on the, um, I wanted to ask a question of staff on number eight, which is the uh, cultural harmony implementation and strategic directions. Um, we're talked about in two uh, a pursue programs and funding opportunities provided by senior levels of go government. Do we have any shovel ready projects that that would be ready to go if funding becomes available? Who would like to take that? 
John Irving, maybe, or Kim, or Serena, or somebody. Okay. Well, we'll ask staff to. Uh, uh, your worship, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, John Irving here. I just had a little technical difficulty there with my uh, with my video and microphone not coming on. Um, yes, through yourself to Council Day. Um, we are working and have assembled a list of council approved capital projects that will be ready to uh, submit for any approval of federal funding should that announcement occur. But we haven't seen that yet from the federal government. No, oh, but thank you. That's so important to be ready because if it comes across the table, let's be ready for it. Good, good job. Thank you. Um, I wanted to speak to number nine, which is the um, uh, request by uh, the West End Wall Center to have um, basically karaoke and dancing. Um, I think it's really important that we have fun things to do in Richmond and all of these activities will be inside banquet rooms and whatnot. So it will not make any noise for the condos. So I think that's an exciting change. Uh, number 10 is the proposed amenities to, um, um, to to not allow engine brakes. You know, I support this wholeheartedly. I live near Steveston Highway and engine brakes are horrible, especially when they're at night. And I'm very surprised that we didn't already have a ban on this because I thought that was universal. So I'm pleased to support it. Um, I did note, though, that on page CNCL 68, that the fine for using engine brakes is only $250. So um, I would like staff to come back in a year really looking at repeat offenders. Anybody can make a mistake once, but if they're just plain ignoring the rules, then I'd like to see that come up considerably for repeat offenders. And uh, number 12, last one there is then uh, Phoenix Netloft uh, deconstruction and salvage. You know, I, I'm really pleased to support this because I look at that entire area of Richmond as Richmond's Fort Langley. And if we don't maintain our heritage, can you imagine what it'd be like if, if no one had saved Fort Langley? And uh, I just think it's really important to look forward and uh, and we learn from the past. So I will be supporting that 100%. Thank you. All right, I've got Michael, uh, Jack, Linda, Harold. Thank, thank you, uh, for your worship. Uh, I will be uh, supporting all the items on the consent agenda. Just have a few comments on, on some of them and a couple of questions to staff as well. Um, firstly, uh, you know, it, in num for number seven, um, the coastal strategy, we have a piecemeal methodology on our coast. Uh, much of the jurisdiction falls on the province. Um, this is one of the important uh, functions of the UBCM, the Union of British Company Municipalities, which uh, our councillors can uh, go to advocate for some of these larger jurisdiction um, changes that, that need to be addressed. So I think this is a great uh, uh, approach to, to do that. And hopefully in September, we can have other uh, municipalities supporting it. Uh, the next one I was going to speak to is number 10. And I got a couple questions to staff on this one. So um, when I, um, I heard a number of issues from residents and, and confirmed myself, especially these three months being at home, um, hearing it, uh, Jake breaks or Jacob breaks, um, I then inquired that we didn't have um, such bylaws in Richmond. And I think that's kind of why I hear the repeat offenders in some of the same areas it be is because maybe the, the, the secret was out that they can just race through and don't worry about rattling their, their, their boxes or, or hitting the brakes um, loudly as they cruise through Westminster Highway and Steveson Highway, because unfortunately those names are leaned towards that type of uh, drive. Um, so my question to staff is related to one of the correspondence we received today. Um, well, two, two parts. First, they, they wanted us to, to have our attention focused on motorcycles and cars with loud, loud exhaust kits. Um, I recall in my younger years that uh, friends of mine with loud vehicles would get pulled over because that was something that was a finable offense. Um, can, that, can that be confirmed by staff that already loud motorcycles and exhaust kits can uh, result in fines? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Wolf, absolutely. That That is part of Section 7 of the Motor Vehicle Act. There's um, definite um, decibel levels that are permitted for different kinds of vehicles. And, and it's also very clear that any unnecessary noise is finable. Perfect. Appreciate the clarification on that. My, my second one is also from that same uh, letter from a resident saying that the, the new efficient trucks um, they have very quiet Jake brakes or Jacob brakes or engine brakes, um, and they have very loud air brakes. And, and the feeling was that if they're banned from using the new quiet 
engine brakes, they'll just go and use the loud air brakes. So uh, what's the deal with that? And, and is it without be included in what's already captured as a, a bylaw offense? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Wolf, um, like I get what the, the correspondent is, is saying, but um, we do have a lot of complaints about engine brakes. Um, the engine brakes, uh, sometimes the, the noise muffler on them does wear out over time. They do get noisier over time. And to be honest, I haven't fielded one complaint about, um, air brakes at all. So I, I don't, I don't see them being nearly as loud as, as the, uh, the typical engine brakes. True. There might be some that are way quieter. Um, but, um, in general, we get a lot of complaints about engine brakes and, and other municipalities have a very similar bylaw to what, what we're proposing. Great. So I just want to thank, thank, uh, thank staff for the quick turnaround on this and getting this bylaw written and brought to us in such a timely manner. Um, finally, my last two uh, points on the consent agenda are both together, 11 and 12 around the Phoenix net loft consultation and deconstruction. Uh, I think by far we've got, uh, the, the right plan ahead here. We're going to work with the public groups that have identified as being like the key stakeholders and getting them involved early in the process. Uh, and to go ahead with uh, deconstruction salvage, um, because if we don't do it now, um, the city could be liable to how it falls or comes apart in the future, uh, or potentially we could just lose uh, much of it and there'll be nothing left to salvage and there'll be damage to the environment underneath. So I think this is the responsible course of action to take. So thank you very much. Okay, I've got I've got Jack, Linda, Harold, Bill. Jack? Uh, I'm going to support every item on the consent agenda, but I just want to comment uh, on a few items, especially on item eight, uh, which is the uh, Richmond Cultural Harmony Plan implementation of strategic directions. Uh, as the person who brought forward these three motions, I would like to thank my colleagues, you know, for supporting my motions at the GP meeting. Um, and I just want to uh, point out that uh, yesterday was the uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day. And my first motion is really related to the First Nations. Um, and I also want to provide uh, some background about these motions. Um, we have the Cultural Harmony Action Plan adopted by Council in 2019. And what I'm just calling for is to implement some of the at the, the short-term uh, action items. So in a way, we're not approving anything new, but just to uh, put in place a plan to implement them. And to me, I think it's very important for us to uh, recognize the cultural heritage and the presence of the First Nations people in Richmond, especially for the new immigrants. Many of them do not know about the history of Richmond, and I believe that they should. And the more they know about the history, uh, a heritage of Richmond, the more they would uh, feel that they belong to our community. And I think with this restoration of the First Nations Bunkhouse, it would complete the cultural heritage mosaic in our, in our city, especially in Richmond. I mean, in Stevenson, because we have the Chinese, we have the Japanese, and we have the Europeans' uh, heritage items. And I think that one will add to the... Um, completion of the cultural mosaic. But of course, you know, I'm just asking staff to do a, 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 a study of the cultural values and the uh, cause and other things regarding to that. So we're not making a decision yet, but it's a step moving into that direction. And finally, I want to point out that uh, in 2019, um, the Canadian Racial Relations Foundation completed a report. And I think it's worth uh, noticing because in that report, they found out that the First Nations and the Black Canadians are the two groups that are mostly um, discriminated against in the, in the community, uh, and, and followed by um, Canadian, Indo-Canadians and the Chinese Canadians. So I think uh, we know that, that although the number uh, of First Nations and Black Canadians is not big in our city, we still have to work for uh, the protection and the promotion uh, of their rights in our city. So I think this is a step uh, in, in that direction. And for the 
two items related to the Phoenix that loft, uh, item 11 and item 12. Yeah, I'm in full support of uh, with the, uh, with the public consultation process and also uh, staff recommendation for the uh, this this construction and salvage. So with that, I will support everything on the consent agenda. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Fail. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I am in support of the consent agenda and just uh, wanted to speak to a couple of items. Uh, number eight, the Richmond Cultural Harmony Plan implementation of strategic directions. And as I mentioned at committee, I will support uh, number one of the motion that staff to propose by November 1st, an implementation plan to include timelines, cost estimates, and cultural heritage value for the restoration of the First Nations bunkhouse. I would need uh, this information and information for all uh, of the other capital projects before I can make a decision uh, to go any further. And I do have a question um, to you to staff. Will programming for the First Nations bunkhouse be included in this part of uh, the recommendation or would that be something that would be considered at a later date? Um, it's Murray Fenwick through your worship to Councillor McPhail. Uh, the, the planning for the Phoenix and the interpretive planning for S Steveston, the timing of these two projects is aligning um, very nicely. So certainly we will be looking at the program planning uh, as part of that planning for the bunkhouse. So it, it won't be, we won't just look at basic restoration. We'll look at the programming that's going to occur so we can budget accordingly. All right, thank you. And uh, with regards to number two and three of the motion, staff to implement sections of the cultural harmony plan, I had the opportunity to bring this up at the recent meeting of the uh, Richmond Intercultural Advisory Committee. We met uh, last Wednesday virtually to discuss the statement on uh, racism and violence related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I just wanted to pass along some comments from the committee and they felt very strongly that um, while they understood the process for the, most, the motion on racism and violence to come to committee and council, they hope that in the future there would be opportunity for the advisory committee to comment and have input. And given that we're directing staff and if this goes through tonight, to implement strategies from the Cultural Harmony Plan. I do hope that the Intercultural Advisory Committee will have opportunity to review and participate fully as their mandate is to act as a resource to the city and to participate in initiatives related to the Cultural Harmony Plan. Uh, number 11, the Phoenix Net Law Public Consultation Process. Um, a question uh, through you, your worship to staff, can what is the timeline for phase one? Um, through your worship to Councillor McPhail, we uh, plan to initiate in September. So we'll do some pre-planning and work with, with groups over the summer. Uh, plan to initiate the public consultation in September. Of course, um, as we're moving through the restoration of services steps, we will adjust our consultation accordingly. Uh, with the addition of the additional groups um, proposed by council, uh, the process for that will take a, a little bit longer. Uh, so we'll we'll be looking to report back, hopefully by the end of the year. All right, and then it would come back to council for further approval to go into uh, phase two of a public consultation plan. Is that correct? Yes, through your worship to Council McPhail, we're we're proposing that we would come back with uh, including the supporting uh, documents, drawings, and that kind of thing before we took that out for the second phase of consultation. Okay. And just for, for clarification, so the nineteen point four four million dollars that was approved in the capital budget for the Phoenix Netloft Preservation Project does not include the costs associated uh, for program implementation to become a museum style interpretive center. Is that correct? Uh, through your worship to uh, Council McPhail, that is correct. Um, the 19.44 million uh, gives you a, a, a shell restored building with no program. Right. So my last question is, will there be discussion uh, in the public consultation process on the estimated costs of the program? Because I think that's really um, important. And it's not really clear in this report that that's what will happen. Um, through your worship to Councillor McPhail, I think what we're looking at doing is in the first phase, we'll explore the program options. And then I think it would be reasonable before we go out for public consultation to come back to Council with some high level estimates of the types of programming that's recommended through the process, what the costs of those would be. 
Uh, Mr. Young, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Uh, yes, as, as Ms. Fenwick says, is the um, it's it's very difficult for us to come up with cost estimates until we know what the programming might be. So when that process is completed and we have an idea of the programs that um, that become apparent, then we'll be in a position to present um, costs associated with those programs. Thanks for that clarification. I just think it's really important to be clear that um, you know it's not just nineteen point four four million dollars we're talking about. We're talking about you know thirty five million dollars in the end. Thanks very much. Uh, Harold? Thank you. Uh, I would like to comment on a couple items. Uh, first, on uh, item seven, the new coastal strategy. I'm really pleased to see that's going forward. Uh, I just want to comment on one thing of, of how important it is to us in the Fraser River estuary. Uh, Fremp was disbanded, but not only Fremp was disbanded, the uh, Fisheries Act was changed as well. Neither Neither Trump, when it was taken over by the port, or the Fisheries Act considers the cumulative uh, damage to the Fraser River estuary as different developments take place. Under Trump and under, under the Fisheries Act, before Harper changed it, uh, they had to consider what was happening upstream and downstream before they added any more, uh, any more industrial development. Now they don't. Under the Fisheries Act, you, you just consider uh, the item, the, the construction that's being built regardless of anything else. And of course, the same with, same thing with the port. So hopefully uh, we'll get uh, a new um, uh, 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 estuary bylaw, coastal, coastal strategy that will um, require that the cumulative impact in estuaries and areas along the coast be considered, just not individual developments. Secondly, I'd like to comment on item eight, the cultural harmony plan and, and uh, Councillor Au's uh, motion to look at the uh, First Nations Longhouse. We've, we've intended to restore it for a long time and haven't, but I think it's opportune now. And I'd like to make a suggestion to staff. Uh, I gave staff, oh, I guess a year or two ago, some photographs of a First Nations Longhouse at Duncan that was identical to this one. And it has, and this one would have had uh, four uh, house uh, posts, two on each, one on each side of the door and uh, one on each end of the building uh, that would have been um, welcoming posts to their house, to their longhouse. And I suggest that we should be able to make, probably make replicas of the ones in the photographs because they're long gone and uh, do that under under using our, our, our arts funds. So I'll, I'll, I'll resubmit those pictures to staff. I bought them as postcards on the internet years ago. And uh, I think uh, it's worthwhile that we would have authentic Salish totems. The Salish people did not carve totem poles. They carved uh, 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 statues of people that stood at the doorways and, uh, and along the walls in their buildings, but they didn't go up uh, as tall totems. And so I think it'd be appropriate to do. There also were a couple of carvings on, of whales that were in front of the BC Packers office when I was a kid. And hopefully we can find a picture of that because that would do as well. And finally, I'd like to comment on the uh, Phoenix uh, Netloft. I have been going through my files and I found, I, I did a report on the Phoenix Netloft, uh, I guess 15 years ago, around two, 2005. And at that time, the federal government was offering $10 million uh, towards having a maritime museum on the West Coast. And so I submitted a report to staff calling for a, a maritime museum for Richmond and at that time, I suggested the BC Packers site the, where the Imperial Cannery was, uh, because we are entitled to put a building of 45,000 square feet. It's still, in, it's, it's still legal for us to do so, uh, where the Imperial Cannery was. Of course, uh, we're looking at 45,000 square feet being very expensive. My second choice, believe it or not, was the Phoenix Netlaw. So I'll pass this little report on as well because I was quite surprised to find that, 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 that I'd already suggested this in, in a report 15 years ago and uh, not, not realizing that it might happen 15 years later. Uh, it was my number two choice because it was a smaller building and not, not big enough for a destination museum, which is what we were talking about at the time. But that said, I think it's important to go back that 15 years because North Vancouver got the $10 million to build a maritime museum on the West Coast. They didn't, and they kept the money. 
So we've got two opportunities here. One is to apply to the federal government uh, for sh uh, shovel-ready projects for heritage funds, but another is to revive that issue of having a maritime West Coast museum. Ours would be a bit different. We would be taking the Chinese bunkhouse, which we already have, and instead of just having Chinese artifacts upstairs and, and an open room downstairs, probably the whole building would be, would be, would be showing Chinese history. Uh, we have three buildings on the site, the Murakami Boat Works, the Richmond Boat Works, and the Murakami House that represent the Japanese community, which we were then could expand upon. And of course, we've got the First Nations Longhouse and the Point House, which is used as a caretaker's house right now to show the First Nations uh, uh, settlements on the BC coast and in our community. So when you combine a museum that tells the story of the coast, you've got to add agriculture in, which is the London farm, Basically, I think we should be in a good position to ask the federal government, government funds to declare us a maritime museum when you add all of the facilities we've got, including the Governor Georgia Canary, together. And maybe we can get some funds in, in that regard. I think it's worth a try. So it's, I think we've got three, three really, really good issues on council tonight. I'm happy to, happy to support them. Okay, Bill. Put your hand down, Harold. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll be supporting everything on the agenda. I'm uh, happy to see that uh, we did change the wording on the new coastal strategy to request action as opposed to just sending letters of support. I think I was happy that uh, people supported my suggestion on that one. As Harold said earlier, we really didn't have any bodies when they were disbanded to uh, support and lobby for the Fraser River and the, uh, the Delta and also out in Sturgeon Banks. It was sort of sent in no man's land and nobody really took ownership for it. So I think hopefully we will get some action on it. Well, I'm, I'm copy on, um, I share the comments on the cultural harmony and implementation. Um, I have uh, uh, some uh, concerns about uh, uh, the particular one uh, that uh, I really believe we do have to ask the intercultural group, uh, as Councilman McPhail said, uh, they're important. They should be on the ground floor, actually, in asking their uh, their advice on this. I'd like to ask staff, um, do we not have information of work that we have done on the First Nations bunkhouse over the years or the Britannia site with some preliminary studies? I know I did a study on the Britannia shipyards back in 1989 as a volunteer, I'm sure Harold had got some stuff that we have information and it would be good if we were able to get that information, just update us and use it as background so we know where we've come from. Uh, I don't disagree with um, what is being asked there and we'll support it. I do though have, I'm concerned about their direction. Um, the strength on number 3A, it says strength and relationship with various cultural and ethnic communities. I would suggest that word be all culture and ethnic communities in Richmond that we have. Given we're talking about a harmony plan, harmony includes everybody and harmony is a two-way process. And I think we have to just, just put various, that's not good enough in my opinion. I think it have to be all inclusive and inclusive of everybody. So I would hope that that word, we'll call that, uh, take it under other under advisement or change it uh, because um, we need to be talking to all people on all programs and all activities within the community, not just various ones. I think we need to go that route. So I pass that on to staff uh, to do so. Um, the other um, uh, things, I'm concerned about where we have um, uh, uh, on number uh, 10, engine brakes and what have you with enforcement. If we know we've got issues, and I brought up a committee about a gentleman who has passed away now by the name of John Simchuk, who on Sixth Road complained about Jake brakes all the time and uh, getting the RCMP out there. I think if we have an issue in Hamilton, we send the appropriate people out there and we, we, we start ticketing, and I'm sure that we will see an improvement. If we just sit and wait, 
I think we go out and, and be proactive to enforce it as opposed to reactive and do nothing and they get away with everything. Somebody said earlier, raise the fines. I don't disagree with that if we have repeated violators. Um, just uh, supporting the uh, Phoenix net, net loft. Um, I think uh, in terms of um, uh, the salvaging, I think uh, where we go, I think we've got to look at the pilings and the foundations. And I'd like to ask Mr. Young, um, is your estimate of 19 million included that? All the, all the, um, the pilings at one time, because um, we did study them at one time when we were studying the Britannia shipyards, and we found that most of them were rotten. Uh, through your worship to Councillor McNulty, um, yes, um, we have, um, going back to 2015, working with uh, Don Luxton, and then through the um, the work we have with our architect and our construction manager now, we've actually prepared a, a list of uh, materials that can be salvaged. And what we're considering at this point in time is is the ability to leave actually the first row of piles intact um, without actually removing them from site, um, you know, assuming all goes well with construction. And you are correct, the, the piles are in a highly deteriorated condition. And so there is certainly some risk um, that that actually can uh, be successful. Yeah, I was down there again today to look at it. And uh, we would have to, uh, what it, what is the process called where we have to drive a pile beside the one that's there, where we have pair pilings, if we were to continue on? Uh, that would be correct. Um, in a previous report, council approved the use of steel or concrete piles. So what we could likely do is um, drive a pile right immediately beside one of the existing piles and do everything we can to preserve it, uh, at the same time making use of the new pile to support the new structure. Now, you mentioned the new structure. I'm just following that to uh, Mr. Young. Basically, we're going to build a new building and utilize what material we can. We're going to actually, that, that's the plan. Uh, through your worship to Councilor McNulty, yes, um, we're trying to salvage uh, as, as many materials as we can. Um, there are certainly some materials that will be very difficult. Uh, for example, the the piles, as I mentioned earlier, are rotten in many in many cases, and pretty much all of them. Um, the siding itself on the Phoenix net loft is, is uh, full of lead. Um, so we do envision that we would be able to save um, some pieces of the siding for record purposes, uh, perhaps encapsulate it um, so it's not a, a safety hazard to anybody you know, seeing it or touching it. Um, and then we have a really good opportunity to save uh, most of what uh, good parts of the superstructure, which includes some of the posts, the truss, trusses, the beams, uh, the floorboards on the second floor. And we're looking at saving those, um, storing them at the uh, warehouse that we own on River Road, and then using them and incorporating them into the project when we rebuild the structure. Now, is the code going to uh, uh, give us any problem in reutilizing and redoing, uh, reusing materials? Like you mentioned, uh one of them has lead in it. Uh, I would think that that's not up to code today. Uh, through the chair to Councilor Mernalty, yes, correct. Um, the siding, we do not anticipate using whatsoever. Um, it, is, it is full of lead and we do not think that we will be using that. Um, some of the other original materials, yes, um, we do think that will present challenges for us to meet code. However, we are working with a code engineer and we will, um, we're looking to prepare a design that incorporates some of the original materials and meets the code and allows full public occupancy. Okay, thank you. The next item, uh, Your Worship, um, in terms of the public consultation on the Phoenix Net Loft, um, I'm looking at it and how we're going about it. I think we really have to give the public a chance to uh, say things. I'm glad the uh, committee agreed to add the uh, extra um, groups uh, to it and the stakeholders, but I think this is a huge project that we've got to um, ask the public where we are. We haven't really come out at from my point of view, and said what we are going to use this for. When we're coming up with program options before we ask the community, I think we do need to know what we need and uh, down there and how to make the whole um, Britannia shipyards viable. And uh, I think that that's um, um, something that we're going to do. The other thing with staff, when they come back, uh, I think it was mentioned earlier, we need the full capital plan. I would agree with that. Uh, because we need to know where the money is. We're going to ask for grants and stuff like that. And is this particular structure going to be a priority over the Stevenson Community Center uh, to build, et cetera? Because we're not going to be able to build both in the same time. So what would the timeline and suggestion be um, on that? 
because we're talking both in the 50 millions, 35, 40 million, and 50 million for a center, and any other that would mean there would be no other uh, capital projects being probably built in the next um, phase of um, our capital plan. So I think staff need to have that and get back to us and keep us in communication on that. And sort of what are you taking out? And that and uh, what program options do we need in that community and in the city? And how does that tie in to our other facilities? So I look forward to it. I think it's a, a bigger task than we think. Um, you know, it's uh, when I look at it and we're looking at it, um, I appreciate uh, uh, what uh, they're trying to do and um, let's see what the public say and come back to us on. So I'll be supporting everything there, Your Worship, and uh, um, hopefully uh, we can get some clarity on the matter. Thank you. Okay, Bill and Harold, your hands are still up, if you could put them down. Uh, Kelly and then Alexa. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my colleagues have spoken extensively to a number of items. Uh, I just wanted to highlight one thing about uh, item seven um, and why it's so important for Richmond. Uh, in particular. So um, we uh, are, we have a jet fuel tank farm in Richmond now uh, being built. It's underway. But the the icing on the cake is that immediately across the river, we've got Tilbury phase two LNG expansion coming. Um, and it's multi times bigger than wood fiber LNG. Um, and if you talk to anybody, um, the idea of having such a facility um, situated where it is um, in the Fraser River, which is a very sensitive um, uh, salmon habitat and directly across uh, the street, so to speak, from um, a jet fuel tank farm. It's just, it's ludicrous. So um, we really need to have a strategy that encompasses all of the um, development that's happening on the Fraser River. Um, and anyone who's interested in the public consultation for Tilbury Phase 2 LNG, um, that's going on until July 16th. Okay, Alexa. Uh, thank you, Worship. I have a couple questions to staff here. Um, now, I've heard the First Nations bunkhouse be called a bunkhouse and a longhouse. Is is there a difference? And which, which one are we? Which one have we got? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Liu, uh, we generally refer to it as the bunkhouse, although people do sometimes use the words interchangeably. So this would have been a bunkhouse associated with a cannery. So it's where Indigenous workers would have lived when they were working at the cannery. Okay. Now, in part of this process, um, are we working with the First Nations if this is their preference? So like if we're going to put a bunch of money into a project, is will this be their preference of projects that we embark upon or, um, you know, will, will they have some input into this before? And then would we go to public consultation on that? Um, through your worship to Councillor Liu, um, in, in terms of the bunkhouse and now extended to the Phoenix as well, we have had initial conversations uh, with the Musqueam around the interpretive plan and interpretation in Steveston. Uh, they are aware of the of the bunkhouse and the potential there, but also the potential for interpretation throughout Britannia um, and at the other heritage sites as well. So um, initial conversations is there is an interest there. And so uh, we'll, we'll continue to pursue that conversation. Okay, because obviously we want to make sure that we're respectful throughout this whole process that we don't, in our zeal to do something harmonious that we don't end up disrespecting or, or treading on people. Um, now for the Phoenix uh, net loft, um, so we're still in the process of figuring out what we're putting in there specifically, um, because I've, we've just kind of seen this, this project go really quickly in the matter of a meeting from 7 million to pretty much $35 million plus. And so this consultation process, um, it, that, that's the opportunity for um, the stakeholders to come in. And it also includes the public coming in, talking about this, or we're gonna have some open houses. Um, through your worship to Councillor Liu, uh, as we've presented the consultation process here, we're proposing that we meet with those groups first come back to council with a refined um, either a plan or perhaps op options for plans before we go out to a broader public consultation. Okay. What if these groups don't like, don't want to move forward with it? 
Um, through your worship to Councillor Lou, we'll report back with what we hear from the community. So, okay. uh, you know, as to the specific options and other feedback we receive as well. Thank you. Okay. So with that, uh, I'll call the question on the uh, consent agenda. All those in favor? Uh, anybody opposed? That is carried. Uh, that brings us to the non-consent agenda items. First one is the application by Yuan Hang Seaside Development Zoning Text Amendment. I'm not going to read the whole thing out. It is lengthy and it is on the agenda. But to summarize it... Move the recommendation. Second. Didn't you want to hear some of it? Uh, okay. I mean, I'm content, but... The reason I wanted to read out a little bit of it, because uh, kind of the gist of it is there's a zoning text amendment to, ch to increase the maximum number of permitted dwelling units from 850 to 941 without any increase in total residential floor area, relocate 10,371 feet, square feet of permitted unbuilt floor area from the first phase to the second and third phase and that the voluntary developer co community amenity contribution secured through the original rezoning is going to be amended to permit the completion of the proposed city center north uh, community center. And that's going to be deferred from December 31st, 2021 to December 31st, 2023. So that is all moved and, and seconded. Um, I've got Councillor Al wanting to speak to it, uh, and I'll go down the list. But <clears throat> I just want to—I just want to mention that, according to the report, as I understand it, and staff's input, um, if we say that you—that community center is not going to be finished by the end of 2021. Um, so it's a matter of uh, being realistic about it. And staff told us, and we can go through it again. The staff told us the last time how we can accommodate the situation and uh, the uh, city center, community center that is now built can more than accommodate uh, the requirements for the time being until this one gets built and open. So let's see now. I've got Councillor Al, good, but just, and I want to go through my list first. I've got Councillor Al, Councillor Day, and Councillor Wolf so far. Councillor Al. Yeah, you sure I have to declare a conflict of interest as a family member is a potential buyer of a unit there. Thank you. Thank you. That slipped my mind. All right. So then I've got Councillor Day, Councillor Wolf. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, this is a massive project um, on, on Capstone Road right along the river. And I would like, because this is such a big project and, and it on the surface can seem a little overwhelming. I'd like to just clear up a few things with staff for the public's benefit. Um, if we allow this delay in the community center, we're gonna get some perks. And for, to me, the bigger ones are that the um, Capstan Station bonus open space is gonna increase significantly uh, from 4,200 square meters to 4,700 square meters. I think there's also going to be a larger plaza area, and then, of course, the Waterside Park and the Kennedy Center. So it's kind of fourfold. So can staff just briefly explain the, the major um, benefits of, of this allowing these, these changes? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Day, in terms of uh, increasing the number of dwelling units, there is a commensurate increase in the amount of public open space that would be provided on the project. Uh, those public open spaces are consolidated into three strategic locations. One is the plaza in front of the community center, which is doubled in size. The other is a new pocket park that would be uh, constructed at the corner of uh, McMinn and Corvette Way. And then the other is uh, a plaza that will be uh, provided at River Road at the entry to the waterfront park. Um, in terms of additional uh, benefits to the community center, uh, the community center design is being revised slightly to provide more solar access to interior rooms that previously did not have solar access. Uh, there is additional uh, cash contributions being provided by the developer to offset city costs associated with the construction of the facility 
And then lastly, the developer is also providing a 50% contribution towards the anticipated cost of furnitures, fixtures, and equipment. Uh, within the facility, the estimated total cost is 1.6 million, so the developer is providing 800,000. All right, thank you very much. All right, Councillor Wolf. Uh, thank you, I'm experiencing some power outage, power outage issues here, here in Hamilton, so if the uh, Wi-Fi cuts out again, um, carry on. Um, the uh, item here, I, I did uh, oppose it at, at general purposes, and um, I'll, I'll speak to it now. I've spoke to it months ago when this was on our agenda. Um, but I, I think even even more reason now, uh, seeing what happens with uh, a lockdown and then a slow release back into our community facilities, I think we need more uh, to help uh, reduce the density of people using uh, our, our facilities. So for, that's one reason why I'm opposed to this uh, going forward. I wasn't uh, privy to the initial um, discussions and the vote to get this project approved in the first place. Uh, I am thankful that council at the time did, in, did have inclusion of the community center north, sorry, city center north community center. Um, however, I feel like we're, we're taking a step backwards with this one here. We're, we're, we're giving a reward to the developer where they can have a higher density bonus um, and uh, as a result, they can delay the by two years uh, a major community facility. Um, as we know, we're going to have to perhaps reconsider some capital expenses, like people have mentioned today. Um, well, this one is already on the list to be built, and, and the spots already picked for it. So it's kind of uh, let's, let's keep. We should be trying to encourage this one to go along as best we can. Now, I know uh, reading the report, there's. Uh, legal issues and other things that that they've claimed are the, are the reasons for, part of the reasons for this and the delay of the capstan and candleline station all that kind of stuff but we um if they're going to delay the community center then yeah i think the inclusion of more open space and i think there's i think four or five things that staff have been able to secure that will be additional benefits to the residents in this area and just the general public so I think that alone is is enough of a of a reward. Unless we were getting um, all the new units um, multifamily or multifamily and multiple multiple room, but uh, to me this this feels like we're um, not get, we're not attracting families and community members into Richmond. We're attra attracting more condo owners. Um, so I don't think that's the direction um, uh, the public needs us to go right now. So thank you. All right. Uh, I'm not seeing any other speakers, so let's move and second it. All those in favor? Uh, those opposed? It is carried with Councillor Wolf opposed. Uh, brings us to the number 14. Then we'll, after that, we'll deal with 14, then we'll get to uh, Councillor Green's motion after that, uh, which is potential temporary road changes in Steve's Village. The recommendation is that the pedestrian, cyclist, and motorist operations continue to be monitored in the Steveson Village for crowding and physical distancing issues and staff report back to council on the need for any temporary measures to add additional space for pedestrians and cycling cyclists should the traffic volume of these modes consistently exceed the capacity of existing infrastructure, and I would so move. Second. Is it, okay, so it's moved and seconded. Uh, what is behind here, as, as council knows well, uh, staff went out and consulted with the businesses in Steveson. They looked at the idea of uh, closing Moncton to traffic between number one road and number three road, and that was not supported by the merchants, at least on that strip. And also the idea of one way on Bayview from number one, right around the corner to on Third Avenue to Moncton. And while that, if you look to the whole group, I believe there was some support for that. Uh, the merchants that were actually on Bayview were not in support of it. So uh, nothing more was accomplished uh, from, uh, from council's point of view. Um, and, and so staff, that's the direction. Staff is to continue monitoring the situation 
and uh, go ahead if if we need some temporary measures to change the traffic, um, the traffic patterns, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I'll turn it over to questions. I've got Councillor McNulty, Councillor Day, Steve's Green, and that's all for the time being. Thank you, Worship. I'll be supporting that the resolution, given the copious amount of uh, comments we got back uh, from the people who actually run the businesses there and um, know what they have to do in order to uh, attract customers to their various establishments. So I'll support that. I do have one question, and maybe it's a uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Lloyd B. What is the speed limit? on Bayview and the speed limit on Moncton. Uh, to your worship, uh, Councillor McNulty, I believe it's 30 kilometers an hour. 30 Ks. Well, okay. Do We have we don't have any signage there. And given uh, I, those of us that frequent Steveson every day uh, and go down there, people are not adhering to it. And in some cases on Moncton, it, it almost between... Um, uh, um, blocks. It, it, it's a Le Mans 500, and I, I think we should have some signage up there, especially now when we've taken 10 feet or more of the roadway for pedestrians um, on um, on Bayview, and uh, also uh, you know in on Moncton, the pedestrian should have the right of way, and some people uh, tend to forget it. And I'm not sure where we can put those, but I think. Uh, probably by the bicycle racks or whatever, we could have um, a few signs or even at the beginning, you know, 30K in Steveston, period. And um, if we have any further problems, then we can get it enforced. But uh, to me, this it makes sense of what the, uh, I was speaking to merchants today, yesterday and the day before, and um, there are those on one side, those on the other. So I think we have to, leave it with the status quo on that. But I would ask uh, Mr. B to look into uh, uh, signage for uh, speed within the uh, municipality. Yeah, if staff could take that as direction, please. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Day. That's Mayor Brody. You know, I, when we came up with the idea of looking at potentially turning Moncton Street into a pedestrian plaza or making, um, you know, Bayview potentially a one-way street, I thought that the merchants would just love this idea because we were going to turn um, Season into an area that could accommodate even more people. And I was very, very surprised by the results and some of the letters that we got back. But one of the things that I am concerned about is like the potential conversion of Bayview got strongly or somewhat strongly 70% support. So I think we have to keep looking at that one. And then when it comes to the potential change on Mountain Street to a pedestrian plaza, we did get 30% that were either strongly or somewhat strongly supportive. So my question to staff is, I, I know you're going to be monitoring this. Is there a, a cutoff date where it's just not feasible? Like if these merchants recognize that this could be an incredible opportunity and realize that, that they, they want to go for it, when is it too late? Uh, to your worship, to Councillor Day, it, I don't know that it's ever really too late. Like it does not take us very long to actually implement such a solution. I, I'd say we could do it in a matter of days. That That's yes. not the issue at all. I would think that yes. the only thing that would limit us is maybe by the end of the summer when the weather turns poorer in the fall. But um, if they change their minds, we could certainly implement something quickly uh, at Council's direction. All right. Well, that's good to hear. I mean, I, I do think we have to support what we've been told so far, because after all, it is their livelihood and their business. But I do think it's a lost opportunity. So thank you. Councillor Steves. Uh, uh, I, I oppose this at the previous meeting. I'll probably support it this time uh, as long as it's monitored. But my concerns are even greater now than they were then. I was in Steveson today, and people are taking it for granted that the, the pandemic is over. They're not wearing masks. I, I saw merchants where you go to the store, and the merchants are wearing a mask, but the public coming in aren't. And people are, are uh, going in and close together or lining up on the door close together. Uh, people on the bus aren't wearing masks. So I think the merchants are going to find that there's going to be a lot of people like me aren't going to be going to town unless there's a, a wide enough sidewalks to, to have distancing. 
uh, when you've got most of the people going in without masks, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a bit of, bit of a hazard. A lot of people look at it as, as being a very dangerous place. Only a couple of weeks ago, uh, we got complaints about Seaston being overcrowded and we got and complaints about Gary Point being overcrowded with people. And I think uh, that uh, that's why a lot of people want to go there. So maybe the merchants will find out that a lot of people aren't going to go there uh, simply because they can't distance themselves properly. My thoughts were that uh, a one-way street, as Councilor Nea said, would be would be a, a, a real gift because anybody driving their car is simply looking for a place to park. And there are very few parking spots on Bayview or Moncton Street when you really add them all up. So they go around, they, they go down Moncton Street, go around the block to Bayview Street, go down Chatham Street and find no parking and they go park someplace else and then walk in. And I think you avoid a lot, would avoid a lot of that if you only had one lane and every one way and, and they could park their cars and if they couldn't find a spot, they, they would get through town a lot faster. And uh, having one less lane would allow us to widen the, the walkways so we can get more people in town and more distancing of the people walking along uh, the street and uh, they can still have just as many cars parked there. Anyway, I'll support it for now. But I think the merchants are making a mistake. Uh, they won't see me in town until this is over. Um, Carol, your hand's still up. Okay, next speaker is Kelly. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I just, I have some, some comments. Um, you know, we did, we did get feedback from merchants, but we only heard from 20% of businesses. Um, and we all have information in front of us that tells us from a city planning perspective and from a transportation perspective that, and an economic perspective that, that, that having opening up streets for pedestrian plazas is the best thing to do. It, it is utterly, um, in, in controversial. And so we're basing this decision on, um, on 20% of businesses and um, those businesses don't have access to the information we have. We have expert city planning and transportation planning information. And while they're experts at their business, that, that isn't their business. And how can we expect them to make an informed decision? If somebody came up to me and says, I'm going to cl close your street, I'd probably say no. If somebody came up to me and said, I'm going to open your street um, uh, for, for business, and and for for people to be here i'd say that's a great idea so like i think that this was really a lost opportunity um you know i'm i'm really uncomfortable with this we're still getting letters from the public saying that there's not enough room um we have a letter from our health officer dr darwar saying that we should really do this and not just here but in a lot of other places in richmond too because it's the safe thing to do um We've, we've talked about this already, like the pandemic response is ongoing. Um, it's not over. The, the pandemic isn't over. It's not even close. We haven't even finished the first wave. Um, and then I just, I, and I wonder if my colleagues have heard um, in Deep Cove, they, they did a street opening for pedestrian plazas and it's been very successful. The businesses are thrilled. Um, the staff in in for Deep Cove, uh, the Deep Cove uh, opening, went to the businesses and asked them what they would like, what what are their concerns, and how can we mitigate them. So they um, reallocated um, space for loading zones to make sure that um, they could still get the product to the stores. They reallocated um, accessible parking, um, and and it it's been fantastic, and and they're very very uh, happy with it. Um, I'd like to have this sent back to staff so that we can get, um, you know, a, a more robust process, but it doesn't seem like there's an appetite for that. Um, I'm wondering if staff can uh, tell us whether uh, we can get a car free weekend going um, at some point, because if we can't um, have this as an ongoing thing, which is a shame because that would support the businesses um, all the time, not just on the weekends uh, in particular, um, uh, restaurants that would like to have patio space um, expanded. Um, can can we do a car-free weekend? Uh, through your worship to, oh, through your worship to Councillor Green, um, to be honest, in the data, there was more support for um, weekend closure of, of Moncton. So 
um, you know, there could be much more support for that. It was primarily the the services like dentists and things like that 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 weren't supportive. Um, and at council's direction, we can certainly um, review and implement such a such a a car free day. Um, can I get the support from council then for um, uh, staff to explore car free weekend? Um, I think staff would have to come back to us. Based on the wording of this, uh, the staff is going to be watching the situation on the need for any temporary measures to add additional space for pedestrians, cyclists, should the traffic volume, et cetera. So I think that within that, they can come back to us if they, they uh, see the need and the wish to implement such a thing. Well, I'm very hopeful that we have something back soon on that. I'm in Steveston a lot on foot and on bike, um, and it's crowded. It's really crowded. I couldn't even find a place to lock up my bike um, on a weekday afternoon. Um, it, 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 it need, we need help down there. Thank you. Well, that's what staff is going to look at. Uh, Councilman McPhail. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, you know, a car-free zone was suggested as a way to support businesses in Steveston by uh, having more... Uh, pedestrian and cyclist access to those businesses. So I was disappointed by the result of the consultation, but I do respect the process. I'm sure that um, the individual businesses are concerned about their own customer base and financial positions. And I know parking was also a concern. Um, and the expanded patio program hasn't had the uptake that we thought it was going to take. So that, that's also disappointing. I do have a question uh, through you, your worship, to staff. Has there been any more discussions with TransLink about the transit hub in Steveston on Chatham? I was there on the weekend. There were seven buses on Chatham. Cars were lined up from number one road to like about Fourth uh, Avenue. I mean, it was a gong show. And I think, you know, it was busy, but there were seven buses on, you know, four on the south side and three on the north side. I think that just adds to the overall congestion there. Through your worship to Councillor McPhail, um, staff is still looking at this and we are preparing a memo for council on uh, potential alternatives. And we have been talking to Coast Mountain Bus Company about um, the bus behavior and congestion on Chatham itself. Yeah, it's very difficult for vehicles to come out of some of the lanes when there's a number of buses there because you have to kind of stick your nose out and then there's traffic. So mm -hmm. when is that report coming? Uh, through your worship to Councillor McPhail. Um, uh, it's, um, it should be soon, probably within the next uh, few weeks or a month. Uh, we can get that. And I think we're planning to bring that to you in the form of a, a memo to mayor and councillors rather than a report at this point in time. All right. I would support a car free day or weekend because I think it has been successful in a, uh, other cities around the province and in the lower mainland. So looking forward to getting something back on that. And we've seen it being successful in Richmond in prior years for special events. Thank you. What about on July 1st? Is it going to be, is Moncton going to be closed off as we've done for the last few years? Uh, Your Worship, uh, I, I don't believe that, that it is at this point in time, but but we could certainly do something if Council directs us to. Well, given that given that we've had it closed off for the last, what, three or four years, I think it'd be worth the effort to, uh, you know, see if there's an appetite for that or go ahead with it or something. Uh, I've got Chuck and then Michael. Yes, Your Worship. Uh I'm also surprised by the survey result. Um, just, I think the original idea from the staff is a good one. And uh, that has been practiced in many places in the world, uh, especially the streets will be closed up uh, during the weekends and it turned into a pedestrian process. And actually it's good for business. Um, but I, I, I think we have the results, so we have to respect that. But I'm also concerned about the pedestrian safety um, and also the uh, social distancing required by the uh, pandemic response. 
So I hope that staff would, uh, as mentioned in their motion, to continue to monitor the uh, situation. And if there's any concern about safety or the social distancing, I think we should come back uh, sooner uh, for um, another discussion about this idea. And also, I think it's worth exploring the uh, weekend closure uh, with um, the merchants there. Uh, I mentioned about you know, probably a pilot project for closure on, the, on weekends. Um, last GP meeting. So I hope that staff would keep an eye and open uh, discussion with um, the merchants there and bring back uh, any recommendations as fit for uh, our further discussion. Okay, Michael. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would uh, definitely support uh, if there were had been a referral to staff to look to implement a car-free day. Uh, typically, the city of Vancouver does it for Father's Day, like we had last weekend. Um, what typically around the world, main streets uh, ha have tried this, and they usually start with a holiday, Canada Day, perhaps for us, uh, and then they usually follow that up with another trial if things work well, and they usually pick one of uh, a regular weekend days, and then if that goes well, then they usually will push to trying a, a full weekend. Uh, I uh, I know the, the what the survey results have said, and I know the statistical significance uh, of having a lower turnout of, of voices that were heard. Um, and uh, I think we need to, to keep it light and flexible in the first round. Um, and I know Canada Day is coming up real quick, so I, I'm I'm not sure if staff can comment on the ability to to arrange the full closure between now and then um, if staff feel that is something that is doable, then I would like to make direction if council supports it. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Wolf, um, if we received uh, direction from council today, um, we would we would be able to um, facilitate a one-day closure for Canada Day on, on Moncton Street. Okay. okay, then as a result, uh, I'd like to keep that tradition al alive. It's, it's, it's worked well. It, uh, my only hesitation is I'd like to hear from our, our public health officer uh, if that's also in agreement with the, the public health authority. Now, it's not like we would be staging an event. Uh, it's it's more about staging the traditional street closure, give people a distance. Businesses can open or close on that day. It's it's up to them. Um, but I would before um, it happened, I would I would definitely want to have um, Dr. Dewar's um, blessing or above her um, to support that. So I would like to make that motion then to uh, direct staff to close um, the, the typical streets for um, July 1st. Well, we'll come back on that. I'll okay. come back to you on that. Uh, Councillor Liu. Uh, Are you with it? Your mute's on, Alexa. Thank you. Um, I I too support this idea of um, you know having some car-free days and maybe doing Canada Day. I did ride around uh, Stanley Park today a couple times and took a good look at how they were doing their parking and and splitting the lanes. And you know there was a number of businesses that occur that happen throughout the park, and they've had to do things to make sure that people can still access it. And I know this was a big concern for some of the restaurants in Stanley Park, and it was a big concern for people with accessibility issues. Not everybody can jump on a bike and ride eight kilometers to go and go for dinner after they've parked their car somewhere else, right? So um, if we are going to go ahead with this, what I think we really also need to do is have uh, a city map on our website and, the, and give the link to all the businesses so that they can add it to their site. So if there so many businesses have added pickup service to their um, what they offer, and so we have to make it so that people can figure out how to get to their business safely and as um, straightforward as possible. Because if we end up closing roads or having these weird closures, we're going to create more chaos and we're going to create a lot of upset. So the more we can do to um, support the businesses with more information and easy, like some maps, the um, online links that they can add to their own website, if they have a uh, site where they do the orders from those kind of things because otherwise um, people are going they're, they're just going to give up and they're not going to come and the businesses are going to suffer and they're going to be angry and I think that's not what we want we want to support this we want to make sure we have all the tools in place 
and really make sure we've got lots of parking available for people who have to drive in. All right. Um, a number of people have talked about the car free day, and we talked about July 1st. May I suggest that we could have a motion, first of all, to direct staff to explore and implement, if possible, a car free day on a weekend or um, or July 1st, uh, which would uh, provide for the uh, closing of Moncton and Bayview Street. Secondly, to communicate um, any action to stakeholders. And thirdly, after implementation, to report back on the results and the success. Something like that? So, so moved. Okay, so that's moved and, and seconded. Um, you notice I put in there Moncton and Bayview. Uh, I don't know whether you want to do that. I don't know whether you want to involve Chatham. Um, I've got some hands here. I've got Kelly first. Uh, thank you. Um, on the referral, or is it, is it referral or motion? Um, in any event. Um, it's, for July, it's, a mo it's a motion to do it. Okay, to explore so it and do it. Oh, excellent. So um, for, for July 1st, that would be a single day event. But I think that if um, we're talking about um, a weekend date, I, I, my preference would be for um, a Saturday, Sunday. Not everybody can get out to one day and they might really want to be there. Um, I, my preference is for if it's going to be a weekend is it's both Saturday and Sunday. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's get the other comments on that and we'll, we'll take that into account. Um, I've got Bill, Carol, Bill, Carol, yeah, Bill and Carol so okay. far. Thank you, Worship. Uh, because we already have closed July 1st because of the parade over the years, I'll support it. But I think we're jumping the gun too quickly. I think we need a plan. I will support it. But if you go down there in any one day, especially when uh, we, we just finished having um, the shrimp boats come in, there were 500 people butt to cheek on, on the walkways, right down to all the boats. There were another 600 people on the boardwalk looking over and uh, not respecting the distances whatsoever. And the rest of the Stevenson Town site, obviously with a number of people, um, we have a, a health problem. We're not following our own rules. So we need to have something. The other thing people are dreaming, we've done parking studies in Steveston. We know how many parking stalls there are. We're going to write, um, wipe out those businesses that uh, have takeout, okay? And because you're not going to be able to get there. You're not going to be able to park. And the residents of Steveston, everybody is going to park on 4th Avenue, 3rd Avenue, and they're going to be all on the avenues down to the residential area. We know what happens with July 1st parade, and that is the parking problem. Yes, Moncton will be free, and that's fine. It will help a couple businesses, but the residents of Richmond are not going to be too, of Steveston are not going to be too happy, but I'm willing to support it only because we already do it on July 1st. I think we need to be very careful with what we're doing down there, or we are going to hurt. We're always focused on restaurants. There's more than restaurants down in Steveston. Please remember that. Everything from grocery stores to vacuum shops to clothing stores to toy shops to whatever. So I think we need to uh, look at those comments that we have in our report. Uh, they're not just idle comments. They're very constructive comments on it. So uh, I will support it going forward because I thought July 1st is something we would do anyhow. And then we can monitor from there. But we do have to have signage of where you can park. And I guess our traffic bylaw officers will not be in Steveston on July 1st. Yep. See, another, po another possibility is we could just give the direction to do this for July 1st, period, and, and have staff report to us at the GP yeah, evaluate right after it. that. Because so, July 1st is Wednesday. The GP is the following Monday, and so that would give us a lot of input right there. Yeah. Uh, and so just 
limited to that based on staff believing that they can, you know, do whatever it takes to implement that for July 1st. And and don't forget, July 1st, is it's different than a regular weekend day. It's a stat holiday. So a lot, Bill, your comments are, are apropos, but remember on a, on a stat holiday, most of those other businesses are closed, or a lot of them are. Mm-hmm. Um, the restaurants certainly are open and wanting to July first. Well, some some of them are, some of them aren't, but probably more than on a regular weekend. Anyway, uh, I've got uh, Carol. Thank you very much, Mayor Brody. Um, so I don't know that I can support Bayview and Moncton being closed. I'm okay with Moncton being closed because that's traditionally what we close for the parade and whatnot. And I think that closing it on Canada Day is intelligent because, you know, the dentist's offices and all those sorts of businesses are not going to be open that day anyhow. So I think that the businesses that generally benefit from having visitors on Canada Day would then be able to host more customers because the road is closed. So I just want to be clear on the motion. I, I don't know that I support closing Bayview because normally we would have festivals and bands and music and all that up on Bayview. Could we limit this motion to just Moncton? Uh, the answer is sure. It's whatever council decides. Okay. Um, so um, Kelly, I've got, I see your hand. Is that still up or uh, up again? Apologies. Okay, so what what I'm hearing, Monkey. what I'm hearing uh, based on the last couple comments is Moncton only, July first. Yeah. Telling, directing staff to explore and implement uh, a closure of Moncton between Number One Road and Third Avenue on July first. Communicate that with stakeholders and report that back. Yeah. Okay. Kelly? Okay, so that's um, the latest motion. Everything just took a left-hand turn with uh, Bayview. Can staff let me, us know whether um, my, uh, Bayview is typically closed on Canada Day? I thought it was closed on Canada Day. I don't think so. Uh, Lloyd, do you recall? Uh, your worship, uh, I'm not certain, but Sonali uh, Hignorani's on here, and, and she may know. Sonali? You yes, your worship. yes uh, your worship, typically on Canada Day, it's all streets within the village core, including Moncton and Bayview Street, as well as the North-South Avenue blocks for that core area. Thank you, Um, because I I think it's important that if people are out on a stat holiday, and particularly Canada Day is notorious for good weather, um, (laughs) the amount of foot traffic that goes between Gary Point and and the dike is unbelievable, Um, and and bicycles. Like, we need to be able to let people have room. It's closed normally anyway. Um, It's a stat holiday. Uh, Let's do it the way we, we usually... Okay, so I'm hearing something different. I, oops, <laughs> take my pen down. Uh, I'm <laughs> hearing something different that we should expand it, not not reduce the area. Uh, uh, Councilor McPhail, did you have something? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, we do usually have all the village closed for Canada Day. We've done that the last couple of years, but I think when we did the consultation, the north south streets were open. Is that correct? And I imagine we're going to do all of it at once, and, and I think that's what you know. People are saying maybe one road, and, and maybe sorry, Moncton as the one road to try is better than the whole village. So just so the consultation was, the north south streets would be kept open. Three worship to Councillor McPhail. That's correct. The north south streets are are kept open. I mean that might be a better way to go, and I think. Um, I kind of like the idea of having, you know, Moncton and Bayview with the north south streets open. And I think it's really important that wherever we land, that we get feedback from the businesses that, you know, so that they're, um, we understand a little bit more how they're feeling because there are some businesses that I'm sure will think this is great and some who will not be so happy with it. And, and I know it is a balance of finding that balance. And I think Councillor McNulty had a really good point about we have to have a plan that we're still in a pandemic. And 
as I think about all that, is there enough time to get that all in place for July the 1st? Hmm. Yeah. Through your worship, oh, through your worship to Councilor McPhail, I, I believe that if we were to um, close Moncton, like block by block and maintain the open um, north-south streets and maintain at least one lane on Bayview, that, that we could um, have that in place by, um, by uh, Canada Day. And, um, you know, there are, our biggest challenge will ultimately be the amount of notice that we give people um, uh, what's going on. Um, but, but the actual getting cones out and closing streets and, and organizing staff um, is, is completely possible. All right, thanks. I would support that plan. Thank you. Okay, remember if we close Bayview and we close Moncton, you, you can't have the North Street, you know, like what is it, First Avenue, Second Avenue, you can't have them open because sure. you can't connect. You know, they're, they're one way. I think, um, I think Mr. Okay. B said one lane of Bayview would be open. Well, yes, if, if we go with only Moncton and leave Bayview alone, uh, you know, then it would work. And then the only the only street we're impacting is Moncton. Okay, um, we're going around a bit, but anyway, I've got Jack, Bill, and Michael. Jack. Yes, we can compromise that we close Moncton, but we keep Bayview with one lane open. And my, my fear is that if we just uh, close Moncton, the problem is that there may be just too many people in that, in that area. So maybe we just divert people uh, further so that, you know, we only have the um, traffic from one way on Bayview. My question uh, on that point is, Lloyd, wouldn't it be very challenging on short notice to make Bayview one way? Uh, your worship, um, it, it's challenging, but it, it's doable. U ultimately, we would be just putting up some signs. And, and if we were going to just do this for one day, we definitely have to have traffic control people out there to help people understand what's going on for that one day. All right. Uh, Bill. Just quickly, Your Worship, in terms of logistics, you hit it on the nose. How do I get to 2nd Avenue, 3rd Avenue for parking? There are hundreds of parking spots north and south of Moncton. How do I cross Moncton? How do I get there in the first place? Okay, I think we really need to think this thing through um, because they are also one ways. Recall? Okay, there are one ways. You come down the south side of 2nd Avenue, it's a one way. You got on 3rd Avenue, you go north, it's a one way. So, how do I get there? And then, with all the pedestrians on Moncton, how do I cross? If, it, if, it, if we have the success that we think we were going to get, um, I, you know, I, I, staff need to, before they jump, have to remember what it's like down there uh, dealing with traffic on July 1st. Remember our issues there. Mm -hmm. I think well, we, we should try something. What it is, I don't think we should be touching Bayview at all because we're going to have to swing out and come down 7th Avenue or 3rd uh, Avenue, I should say, and it's got to be a ring road. Okay, and then you're going to have to let people come down the various one-way streets to park. Or we will okay. lose hundreds of parking spots. All right. And I'll leave it with you. Michael. Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I am in support of a lot of what I've heard. I think uh, to keep things simple for everybody, uh, just the same closures that we typically have on on. Uh, Canada Day in the past, I, you can just do a quick Google search, road closures for Salmon Fest, and you get the, the typical map. So it'd be really accessible for people. Yep, sure Businesses that are there already know where the closures are. It wouldn't be 24 hours. It would just be the same time typically as the as the parade happens, so the, the, the bulk of the day there in the, uh, daylight. And uh, it's open again for the, the evenings. Um, so I think there's, there's just, and, and yeah, keep it on July 1st. Um, for this round, again, it, it, we've got the great habit uh, that's formed, and I think we we stick with with that. So. Oh, now, Lloyd. Historically, we closed those streets off. Whatever we closed, we closed it for the entire day, didn't we? Yes. It wasn't just uh -huh. parade time. 
uh, uh, your worship, I, I believe it was closed for the bulk of the day. Like, I, I don't think it was closed overnight or anything like that, but, but during no. the bulk of the daylight hours. Six o'clock to six. Okay, so what I'm hearing, as we're kind of working this through on an informal basis, what I'm hearing is that people want to uh, close Moncton from number one to number to Third Avenue, <clears throat> but where there's a discrepancy is some people want to have the wider area that we've had on July 1st. Some want to take Bayview and make it one way. Some want to close it. Some want to leave it alone. Um, so, uh, is there any consensus here that anyone can point me to? Um, uh, I'm happy to go with Councillor McPhail's suggestion, which was uh, staff's original um, consultation that they did with um, the Steveston merchants, but do it for the July 1st day. Just doing it July 1st. Okay, so what you're saying is one way on one way on Bayview, close off Moncton. Is that is there? I'm, I'm getting a bunch of hands that are people that are agreeing with that. Can can we live with that one? Okay, it it does look like there's approval on that. So it's a tall order, though. I do say for staff to do it on short notice, but you'll show how effective you are. I'm sure once again. So the idea is Moncton, Moncton would be closed. Bayview would be one way. This would be from morning till night on July 1st. Communicate with stakeholders, report to, back to us immediately so we can discuss it further and further measures on the July 6th uh, GP meeting. Okay? Carol? We could make one little change that instead of saying Moncton is going to be closed, I think Councillor Green has it nailed on the head. We're going to open it to pedestrians only. No, let's call it what it is. We're, we're closing traffic off. You it's can call space. it what you wish. All those in favor? Anybody opposed? Okay, so that's carried. And if I'm not mistaken, I think we need to call the question on the main motion, don't we? Yes. So, so the rest of the get a word motion, in there. Sorry, I had my hand up for all through this. Oh, sorry, I didn't see it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in favor of the clo of of the one way on uh, on Bayview Third and Number One Road, but I'd like to refer to staff to figure out which way it should be. Uh, there's two parking lots that we need to get people into. One is the the Stevenson Harbor Authority parking lot at Third Avenue on Bayview. So which is the best direction to come in from Third Avenue or to come in from one road? And then, of course, there's the parking lot of the Harbor Authority and the city has at First Avenue and Bayview. So uh, it's, it says how you get to those two, two spots. The uh, one at uh, number uh, Bayview and Third Avenue is for fishermen only, people who have permits. But for some reason or other, a lot of them go down there on July 1st, too, and park. So I think we have, and, and we have to have leave access for people to get there. So it depends which way is the best way to get there. Westbound. Malcolm, your mic's off. Oh, I get to say it again. <laughs> it's a fair point. Lloyd, it's a fair point. Can you just take that as part of your challenge, uh, that the situation of the parking lots and how you get to them? Uh, sure, Your Worship. Um, ultimately, the plan that we brought forward to you as part of this, this whole report um, did address um, all of those things, in, in our view, in, in the best way possible. Re remember, the uh, Harbor Authority parking lot is a pay parking lot. That must be um, told to people. And as Harold said, if fishermen want to go fishing on July 1st, which they might do and they have been passed, do we let people park there, the public park there? It's a tow-away zone if the Harbor Authority wants to enforce it. So we should communicate with them immediately. I think it's a pay parking lot and it's marked as yeah. such, and that's what people will do. Okay. But we'll leave that to staff. And then we're going to call the uh, 
Call the question on the main motion. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, anybody opposed? So that's carried. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll look forward to uh, staff's report back on that, see where it goes. Uh, Councilor Green, you had a referral motion that you circulated. Do you want to just read it out? The, the motion is to um, uh, take a look at the accessible parking in Steveston and uh, bring back any ways that we can improve it. All right, so that's a direction to staff. So is that seconded? Second. All right, any discussion on that? All those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Uh, and the final item of business is on the annual report and the annual report highlights. Uh, Finance Committee recommends that the 2019 annual report and the annual report highlights be approved, and I would so move. Second. Moved, moved and seconded. Discussion on that? All those in favor? Any opposed? Oh, Councillor Green, or Councillor Wolf, you had a, something to speak about. Yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, just very briefly. Um, so uh, the, knowing that the casinos are closed and, and Dr. Henry saying that's one of the last things she'll ever open um, or allow open, uh, and the gaming uh, revenue that we typically were expecting, we're budgeting about 16, 000, uh, sorry, 16 million um, this year. And we've uh, been told up to date uh, now we've lost a considerable amount of that. Um, if that remains uh, off the table, what, um, and seeing in the rep in the report here, uh, it's mentioned a number of times as other revenue. Um, mon many of those other other revenue sources are things that we have a bit more control over, but this one, not so much. So, uh, and it's a considerable amount compared to all the other uh, revenue sources. So, uh, I remember our staff speaking previously about the way that the city of Richmond um, uh, incorporates it is different from other municipalities, and, and the way we do it is is obviously better. Um, but could, could staff just clarify how the way we're budgeting this and the way we have it recorded in finances is, is, is going to be good for us in the long run? Well, the idea is that we, we try to avoid putting, putting the uh, revenue from gaming into your, just into your regular revenues. You try and use them for one time only uh, expenditures. And so that's what we do. But remember, this this is the 2019 mm -hmm. financial statements. We're not talking about COVID or anything like that at this point on this on these documents. Yeah, for sure. Then if that's the answer to that one, then my, my second one, also brief, on this on the same page of the report where the revenue and expenses are, um, it mentions uh, the Richmond Olympic Oval, and, and that's about the same amount, about 16 million. I'm, I'm just curious, that factor there as an expense, does that also take off the the money that was that is gained from parking rent investment sponsorship and other things like that is that like the after all the revenue from the oval then then the expense or, or does the oval also have a revenue line somewhere i'm not seeing well this isn't the report from the oval this is a report from the city yeah. so it would reflect the subsidy that we give to the oval each year so that that sixteen million is is after the subsidy and after any revenue from all the operations. I feel. I don't I don't know where you're referring to, but that's that is the sur I think that's the surplus that is left over over the years, which would ultimately go into uh, uh, restoring the premises uh, as it deteriorates over time for capital expenditures. Okay, so. Those are my two questions. They both similar amounts of money. I just want to make sure things equate in the end here. So I appreciate that. Uh, All right. Any other points? We'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. That brings us to the announcements. I have a few announcements to make. And just remember uh, what was mentioned a few minutes ago, that this will be the last meeting. It's the fifth Monday next week. So this is the last meeting before July 1st. We, on July 1st, uh, that's why we mute this. Um, we're going to have Canada Day at home. Uh, Canada celebrates its 153rd 
Earth Day on July 1st. Celebrations are different this year, obviously, because of the limited public gatherings that we can enjoy. The City of Richmond is partnering with the Seas and Community Society to celebrate Canada Day at home on Wednesday, July 1st. So if you want to look at the event, uh, look to our city website forward slash Canada, uh, Canada Day. And then we have some Grad 2020 signs and some public art projects. We have two new initiatives that have been added to the Richmond is Heart campaign. The Grad 2020 signs have been installed at several scenic locations across the city as backdrops for fun and safe photo opportunities. So we encourage Richmond grads to use these signs and post them for family and friends with the hashtag, hashtag Richmond has heart. There's also a public art program with a, a series of artists initiated projects that explore new and meaningful ways to find community connections during COVID-19. So to find out how you can participate in the Richmond is Heart Public Art Project and the grad photo locations, go to our website slash Richmond has heart. Now, I think most people now know that City Hall is open for property tax payments. A reminder that the property tax payment deadline, uh, the due date is July 2nd. Flat rate utility bills are due June 30th. Property owners are encouraged to pay on time to keep vital services in place to support community needs during these challenging times. Payments can be made at City Hall where physical distancing is in place and it's enforced. And you can make your payment by check, debit, or credit cards or by check in the Dropbox. Cash is not accepted at City Hall or in the Dropbox. People can pay also through their financial institution. Information on the payment and process is on the city website, uh, richmond.ca slash tax. Uh, just to mention that, uh, as Councillor Al mentioned earlier on in our meeting, June 21st was National Indigenous Peoples Day. Normally, there's a whole range of activity during that day, uh, but uh, there wasn't uh, too much uh, this year because of the circumstances. Then we're pleased to announce that the BC Recreation and Parks Association awarded the City of Richmond with, uh, with its Facility Excellence Award. Uh, the award is for our work on restoring the Edwardian Cottage, a heritage building in Terranova dating to about 1920, so 100 years old. The single-story wood frame cottage originally served as a residence for workers at the Terranova Cannery. Today, it's operated by the Terra Nova Nature School to support connections to nature that reflect the city's 2022 parks and open space strategy and physical activity goals identified in our community wellness strategy. So we're delighted to receive this award and congratulate the staff and all involved in preserving this important piece of local history. So, uh, Based on that, I will now go to the development permit, Madam Clerk. If I can just add one one event, uh, sorry, one addition to yes. the event there. Uh, thank you. Uh, you mentioned about the grad uh, commemorative photo stations. I, I spoke with staff, and they're actually going to put up um, potentially one or two more in East Richmond to help with many of the Camby and, and McNair grads who are quite further away from the other six locations. So so if any, anyone is, looks right now and sees the six addresses, just stay tuned. There'll be another one, maybe McLean Park or something like that. Thanks. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, development permit panel. Thank you, Your Worship. There are two recommendations for council. Recommendation one, that the minutes of the development permit panel meeting held on June 10th and the chair's report for the development permit panel meeting held on May 13th be received for information. And recommendation two, that the recommendation of the panel to authorize the approval of changes to the design of the development permit issued for the property at 5333 number three road be endorsed and the changes be deemed to be in general compliance with the permit. So moved. Moved and seconded. Discussion on that? All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Someone move adjournment. So moved. Thank you. We're now adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Good night.